All right, so we are live, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms and homes around the world. Although we really ramp up starting in September and we're starting to populate our site with all sorts of cool programs, we have been doing a smattering of programs over the summer. We're so thrilled you guys are continuing to join us live on camera and on YouTube. Today, it's very exciting for me because we get to continue our awesome series with Parks Canada. We've done everything from fish to bison to bears and more. Uh, we are joined live today in beautiful Banff National Park by Alex Jones. So she is going to highlight all the cool work she gets to do. And I love the actual bio they sent in for this one, which you'll see on YouTube, which is join Parks Canada and jump into the world of fire, which sounds both epic and awesome and also very threatening and dangerous. So I'm excited for fire and grizzlies today, a prescription for conservation for one of the most enigmatic and awesome species in the world. Uh, so without further ado, thank you so, so much for joining us, Alex and take us away. Awesome, hi everyone. My name again is Alex and I'm a fire communications officer here in beautiful Banff National Park, which is where I am today. Um, it's a beautiful day outside. Now it's my job to basically educate the public on the important role that fire plays here in the park. And during things like wildfires or prescribed fires, I also provide important information to the public so that everyone stays informed and stays safe. But in the past, I've been lucky enough to work as a wildlife guardian here in Banff as well. And at the time, it was my job to manage those roadside jams. So when people are stopped to take photos of things like bears and elk, and it was my job to provide them with information and some education on how we can view wildlife safely, but also respectfully. So I can say that talking to people about both fire and bears is probably my favorite thing to do. It's something I'm very passionate about. And at the end of today's talk, I'm more than happy to share some cool stories with you guys, if you're interested anyways. Now, today we're gonna talk about fire and grizzlies, a prescription for conservation. So how we use fire to help out these charismatic critters here in the park. But before we really get underway, it's important to acknowledge that Banff National Park is within the present day territories of the Treaty 6, 7 and 8 First Nations, as well as within the Métis Nation homeland. So the lands and the waters within Banff National Park have been used for thousands of years by many different Indigenous peoples for things like sustenance, ceremony and travel. And if you're not really familiar where Banff National Park is, we are located within the province of Alberta, about an hour and a half away from the city of Calgary, um, within the Rocky Mountains. And we're pretty cool because we're Canada's first national park, but of course we're not the only national park out there. Banff is part of a greater network of national parks, national historic sites, and marine conservation areas. And Parks Canada is the caretaker of all of these places. So no matter where you are across the country, there's somewhere for you to check out. And I definitely recommend that you explore these places, maybe online right now, and in the future, come check them out in person because they're very cool and they have great stories to tell. Now, people within Banff National Park, well, they've been traveling to this area, of course, for thousands of years, but present day, people travel to us from all around the world. And they travel to, uh, to maybe check out our cool wildlife, our beautiful waters. There's some really cool lakes here in the park. Sometimes they come to connect with nature or even connect with themselves. So it's a very special place. And Parks Canada gets to be the caretaker of this special place, which is the agency that I work for. And as the agency of Parks Canada, we're responsible for ensuring that the park stays healthy for both present and future generations. And we work to ensure the ecological integrity of the park which is kind of a gross word, but basically it means we try to make the park healthy and keep it healthy. And one way we keep the park healthy is by using fire. 
Now, to get things rolling, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a very brief little video clip of fire burning through a forest. And depending on how the internet connection is, it might just be a still image or it might be the video clip, so bear with me. But what I want you to do is if you have a piece of paper, I'd love if you could draw or write some words about how that fire on the screen makes you feel. When you see fire burning in a forest, is the first thing that comes to mind maybe like, ooh, that's scary, or I just see flames, I see things burning. What comes to mind? I also encourage you to use the chat box today and uh, throw some words my way. I'd love to see them. So here, let's have a look. So we see some fire burning around the base of a tree. We see some burned plant material. I'm gonna show you that one more time. So what words come to mind when you see that fire moving through the forest? Do you just see flames? Do you see destruction? What do you see? Well, we can do too, Alex. Uh, I've asked people on YouTube if they want to type in anything in the chat bar, and so please do for anyone watching at home. But I can go to our live group to see if they have yeah, any thoughts about it. Let's do it. Perfect. So in Oshawa, you ladies, what do you guys think about when you see the fire? Oh, there we go. You're unmuted. Perfect. You should be good now. Mm, wants to work. <laughs> Thinking about it. <laughs> you can always type in the chat bar too if that helps. Or Elizabeth, if you guys have any thoughts in California. No, that's okay. <laughs> no worries. Well, type in the chat bar to me and we'll see if we get any comments on YouTube too, but you can keep going with your presentation, Alex. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So a lot of words that usually come to mind when I ask people this question are the words like wild and maybe scary. And all of these words have been used to describe fires over history because fire at a glance can seem really intimidating. And because of that, fire has been misunderstood for a very long time. And it's actually caused some negative consequences that we can see with our own eyes today. Now, if we take a, bit, uh, take a look at this new photo here on the screen, what we're going to see is a valley in Banff. And in that valley, there's a lot of really dense forest. So trees that are growing very close together. And those arrows are pointing to that shaded portion. And if you look at the greater picture, there's a lot of dark areas there. That's all forest. Now, if you were in that valley bottom and you looked up at the sky, what you would see is the tops of pine trees, you might see a little slice of sky, but there wouldn't be a lot of sunlight coming down to the forest floor. If you looked around you, what you would see is trees like lodgepole pine or spruce trees. They would be growing very closely together. They'd be the same type, the same species, about the same age, the same heights, because they're all competing for sunlight. And if you looked at the ground on the forest floor, you would see trees that have fallen over, a lot of branches and logs, and debris that accumulates over time. Do you think that this is how our forests are supposed to look? Well, before you answer that question, let's take a look at this next photo. So this photo is from about 100 years before that previous one. And there's quite a few differences. I'll just pop back quick. You'll see all the shaded portions in the present day photo. And then in the historical photo, you'll see that those shaded portions are few and far in between. So if I was in that same spot in this historical photo, in that lighter, shade, that lighter area that's not shaded in, if I looked up at the sky, it would probably be a beautiful sunny day. There would be a lot of sunlight coming in. I wouldn't have my view obstructed by a bunch of trees. Uh, if I was looking out around me, I would see a mixture of pine trees and uh, deciduous trees, so those leafy trees, kind of like a mixed forest. 
And if I looked at the ground, I would see a lot of grasses and maybe some shrubs like buffalo berry bushes. And I probably see some wildflowers. This is the result of allowing fires to burn in the forest. Whereas this previous photo is the result of not allowing fires to burn. So a hundred years ago and beyond that, we actually had more mixed forest within Banff National Park and not just valleys of forest carpeting the forest floor. Now throughout today's presentation, I encourage you guys to use that piece of paper and make drawings and add some new words that describe what I'm talking about on screen. Because what I'd really like to see at the end is people email me their beautiful drawings or doodles. It's okay if you're not an artist. What I want to see is your feelings about fire change over time. Because that's natural. We see our uh, view of fire shift. And I encourage you to also use that chat box as well to share some thoughts throughout the presentation. And Jesse can uh, alert me to those. Now, as I said, a lot of these words that we use to describe fire historically have been quite negative, and that's okay. You know, people have their own experiences with fire that, that uh, instruct them how they're going to feel. So what I mean by that is if you live in an area that experiences wildfires, if you've ever had wildfires come near your community, it's totally normal to fear fire, to think of it as a negative thing. And you know, over 140 years ago, new settlers within the Rocky Mountains felt the exact same way. You know, fire was a threat to lives and to their property, like their homes and businesses. And so over 100 years ago, people worked really hard to try and extinguish fires every time they popped up. This was a lot different than the way that we used fire way before settlers arrived. Indigenous peoples used fire as a tool for thousands of years. They used fire to clear travel routes so they could travel through areas a bit more easily. Uh, they also used fire to create habitat for game species, so elk and bison. So people have coexisted with fire for thousands of years. But when settlers arrived, there was this inherent fear of fire. So for that reason, every time one popped up, they worked really hard to extinguish it. And because for the past century, fires were not allowed to burn on our landscape, we've actually had some negative consequences pop up that we can see. So for over about a hundred years, fire all but disappeared from Banff's forests. And this has created a buildup of trees and plants, creating these really dense forests throughout the park. And over time with these really dense forests, what we saw is if you looked up, that forest canopy, the cover, well, it increased. If you looked at the sky, there's very little sunlight coming down to reach the forest floor. And without sunlight, sun-loving plants, well, they couldn't grow. The habitat for them was not there. So we saw a decrease in habitat. And because some of these plants started to disappear, the different types of wildlife that rely upon them also left the area. So we saw a decrease in biodiversity of both plants and wildlife. Now, suppressing fire has had negative consequences on our park from an ecological standpoint, but it's also created a more dangerous landscape to people. Now, if you look at the photo on screen, what you're gonna see is a lot of fallen over trees and branches and logs and a buildup of shrubs. This is what we call fuel. Because if a fire were to ever start on the forest floor, it would build up kind of like kindling for a fire. 
and it would build up and build up and it could start transferring to trees and getting larger. And because the trees have grown so close together, it can pass from tree to tree to tree very quickly. And this leads to more intense large scale wildfires, the kind of fires that can threaten communities and the kinds that we see on TV. So having more frequent fires on a semi-regular basis, this can actually help reduce all of that fuel on the ground and thin out the trees a bit and create safer landscapes for people. It kind of, it's kind of like, I guess, Mother Nature doing her spring cleaning. So every 50 to 100 years, which is probably about as often as I clean my own room, the forest needs some fire to kind of clean that ground up and space out the trees. So we see fire start in the forest, it cleans up the forest floor, it burns down the logs and the shrubs and it spaces out some of those trees by making the very dense closely standing trees fall down, spaces them out, and what we see after a fire is this more open landscape. It's like a mixed forest sometimes or simply just thinned out trees. Now these areas are great because it provides different habitat for different kinds of wildlife and it also creates a safer landscape because fire can't pass from tree to tree to tree as quickly. Now, in particular, animals like the grizzly bear, they love recently burned spots. What we see following a fire is an increase in bear foods, especially berries. The berries start producing more, and so it's this really great food spot for grizzly bears. And so when we have fires moving through the forest, we actually have a lot of benefits from it, as long as we can control it in a safe way. Now, in the park, we of course have bears. We have grizzly bears and we have black bears. And I've been very fortunate that I've been able to experience both of these type of bears out on the landscape, living their wild lives. And they actually spend a lot of time looking for food. A lot of their life is searching out really good food sources. But depending where you are in the world right now, you may or may not have bears. But if you do, your bears probably have a specific diet that's very different from other areas of the world. And what I mean by that is if you live in British Columbia, for example, out near the ocean, well, those bears have a lot of access to fish. So they're gonna search out fish more. They're a really great source of protein, a great source of fat, and so it's a really good food source for them. If you live down in the United States and you've ever been to Yellowstone National Park, those bears have a very similar diet to Banff. However, they're lucky because they get to eat these little maws. What happens is in the late summer, right around now actually, these army cutworm maws, which is kind of a mouthful, they migrate into Yellowstone and what they're doing is they're searching out these alpine flowers, the wild flowers that grow up in the mountains. But during the day, it's really hot. And so they escape the sun by crawling under rocks. So during the day, bears have realized that if they go up and flip over rocks, they have access to all these little sources of protein. Now, that might sound gross, but it's a good source of food for bears. If you're a bear in Banff National Park, however, our bears spend a lot of their time eating plants. Now the little girl that you see on screen, she's munching on a dandelion, so bears do eat dandelions, but they also eat a lot of berries. Now I'd like you guys to take a guess. What percentage of plants make up a bear's diet in Banff National Park? Do you think bears are A, 10% vegetarian, B, 35% vegetarian, 
C, 60% vegetarian, or D, 80%. So using that chat box, just throw in your guess. Do you think it's A, B, C, or D? All right, looking for the chat box. Dylan in North Carolina has found it, so our other people live on screen, you can type that in. My vote 60. I'm going out on a limb with that one. We got 35% in California. Okay. And I think our group in odd 35%, and everyone thinks 35%. Okay, B across the board. All right, well, surprise. Bears are actually 80% vegetarian here in Banff National Park, which might seem astronomical. But there's a reason for it. That is what is most abundant in the park. There's a lot of plants that bears can feed on. Now, bears still like to eat a lot of meat. And I mean, they, they'll search for things like uh, carcasses, which are dead animals. They'll also dig up ground squirrels. So the little critters that bury under the ground, the bears will dig them up and eat them, kind of like little bear steaks. Um, and they'll also eat the, the calves from elk. So they do eat meat. However, here in Banff National Park, they spend most of their time looking for vegetation. So different plants like the roots from sweet vetch, dandelions, kinniknik, clover, horsetail, and buffalo berries. This is what makes up the majority of a bear's diet here in the park. But one plant in particular is very important to a bear's survival, and that is the buffalo berry. Now, buffalo berries are these little red, yellow, or orange berries. They're quite small in size, actually. It's like if you had a pencil, that little tip on top, the eraser, that's about the size of a buffalo berry. And bears spend a ton of time eating these berries. In the late summer, they'll actually spend most of their waking day eating these berries. In fact, they'll eat upwards of 250,000 of these berries every day. Now that's kind of hard to think about, but in human terms, that's like if you ate 65 hamburgers every day. That's mm. a lot of calories, right? And that's how these bears are packing on weight for the winter time. It's essential for their survival that they eat these berries. Now, the berries tend to grow in sunnier areas um, near the forest, kind of in these disturbed sites, which are areas like trails or beside the road or beside the railway. And because this is where the berries grow, this means that bears are attracted down to where people are, which can be very dangerous, both for people and bears. But bears don't really have a choice. This is where the berries are growing. So this means that they open themselves to risks that are not found in the rest of the forest. Things like car strikes or train strikes or people approaching bears and feeding them human food all of which is very, very bad for bears. But when you're in the park, usually if you see a bear, they're beside the road. So how you can help these guys out while they're eating their berries is just by giving them lots of space and never feeding them. These bears are very important to our ecosystem. In fact, within the province of Alberta, grizzly bears are a threatened species. So they need a bit of help from us, especially. And fire is one way that we're able to help these bears. Now, remember that when we don't have fire, those trees, they start building up over time and growing very closely together. A lot of stuff falls on the ground and it gets very dense. It's not good habitat for bear food. Fire, opens these spaces back up and it increases berry production. So these berry bushes do really well following a fire, which means that grizzly bears are directly impacted by fire in a positive way. Fire helps to create habitat. So something that we do in the park is create these openings in the forest away from these dangerous spots like the highway and the railway and from people and trails. 
So we'll burn areas in the back country, even in the front country, but away from the roads in order to create new spots for bears and uh, get them away from these risky spots. So that's one of the ways that we help bears in the park by using fire. Now, Banff National Park is not new to the world of fire. In fact, we have been using fire since the 1980s, which to some of us was a very long time ago. In fact, I wasn't even born in the 80s. So we've been using fire for a long, long time. And because of that, we have quite a few fire specialists and experts working for us for Parks Canada. Now, these fire specialists are responsible for writing and implementing something called prescribed fire. So this is where we light fire on purpose under very controlled conditions. And a prescription, well, it describes the procedures and the conditions necessary to burn both safely but also effectively. So conditions for fires include what weather we need, the types of vegetation we want to burn, and the terrain, like the aspect and slope. All of this influences fire behavior. So we have to describe all of these conditions in order to use fire safely. Now, prescribed fire is very similar to a human going to the doctor. So bear with me here. I want you to close your eyes. And what I want you to imagine is a time when you went to the doctor. So maybe you were sick and you needed some antibiotics or you were injured and needed some pain medication. Well, you went to the doctor and you said, doc, help me out. These are my symptoms. This is what I'm experiencing. These are the problems that I have. The doctor will listen, they'll ask you a bunch of questions, and using their knowledge and a bit of research, they'll come up with a plan to treat you. Now, on that prescription that they write you, they describe to you exactly how much medication you need to take and how often. And as long as you follow those exact description, as long as you follow those exact instructions, you'll likely feel better after you finish all of your medication. But you have to follow that prescription. Prescribed fire is very similar. So sometimes the forest gets old, sometimes it gets sick, sometimes it just needs a bit of our help. So fire specialists in our park, just like doctors, well, they'll examine the forest and figure out what's going on. And if appropriate, they'll prescribe the forest some fire. Now, as long as we follow that exact prescription, so the conditions like weather and terrain and vegetation, as long as we follow those instructions very carefully, we can use fire safely and effectively to treat our forest and ultimately make the forest healthier for things like bears and different types of plants and elk, all of that increasing biodiversity. However, the tools that we use to do prescribed fires are a lot cooler than what a doctor uses to treat you. And I'm sure I'm going to get a ton of emails at the end of this presentation from doctors, but bear with me here. Now, some of the tools that we use to start prescribed fires include things like drip torches. And drip torches are this little canister that you hold and it's full of this gasoline diesel mixture. And as you walk along the ground, it comes out and it ignites and it starts the ground surface on fire. So it can start lines of fire. And that's one way that we can burn the forest. Another way that we can burn the forest is by using something called aerial ignition devices which is again, a big fancy word, which is basically the ping pong balls that you see on screen. Now these are no ordinary ping pong balls. These little balls are full of a mixture that when they fall, fall out of the helicopter, they're pierced and essentially ignited. And as they fall from the sky, they start to catch fire. And it's kind of like raining, raining fire from the sky essentially. And that's another way that we can start fire. I think that's pretty cool. 
Now this last one, but of course not all we use, but the last one on screen here is the heli torch. And I promise you, there is nothing more metal than a helicopter flying through the sky with a giant torch attached to it, lighting fire to the forest below. There is nothing cooler than that. And it is my personal favorite. Now we tend to use these things when it would be too dangerous for firefighters to be on the ground. So we need to light these larger prescribed fires from air. It's super, super cool to watch. And uh, I'm happy to talk about it later, but this is my favorite way we start prescribed fires. As cool as these tools are, it's still important to recognize that this is fire. It could be very, very, very dangerous if not used appropriately and safely. And so it takes a very long time before we're able to actually burn a forest. In fact, it can take years of planning and research before we can ever put fire to the ground. It's never as simple as just dropping a match. That would be very dangerous and hard to control. Now, one example of a prescribed fire within the park that you can actually see if you visit the park is the Sawback Range. So as you drive west from Banff, from the town of Banff towards Lake Louise, on the right-hand side of the road, you'll see the Sawback Range. Um, and this is an area that we've burned a few times. Now, I'd like to get you guys to guess how many times we've burned the Sawback Range. Do you think we've burned it twice, five times, eight times, or 11 times? Let's take a guess in that chat box. All right, so you've got eight so far as one. My guess is 11 because you tricked us with bears. We got five, eight, 11. So five, eight, and 11, no one says two. What do you think, Alex? <laughs> well, you're right. We have not burned it only twice. We have actually burned it 11 times. Yeah, that's a lot and it seems extra, but there's a reason for it. Now, that big sawback range, we don't necessarily light the entire mountain range on fire at the same time. A lot of the time what we do is we'll burn these larger areas in units or blocks, smaller sections. Each section has its own kind of prescription depending on the vegetation around. And so that contributes to the amount of times we burn sawback. Some of it has just been in units. Some of these units, however, have been burned more than once. And the reason for that is because of the vegetation that grows afterward. A good example is the photo that you actually see on screen there. So, if you look at the photo, what you're seeing is all of these baby trees popping up after a fire. And the reason for this is because during a fire, cones from the lodgepole pine actually open. So these serotonous cones have this kind of gluey stuff and in the heat it opens and it releases its seeds. And after a fire, these little baby lodgepole pines are able to grow right afterwards. So this is a really great adaptation to fire. However, if we let all of these little baby trees grow back up, we'd actually have the same problem that we did at the beginning, kind of like a more closed forest, not great habitat for different plant species or animals. So we had to burn it a few more times to kill off those little baby trees and other plants to open it back up. Now, before we wrap up today, I'd really like to talk about one more thing. We can't always use fire to create habitat and to keep our community safe. Sometimes it's not possible because of the proximity to town. So one example of this is right in the town of Banff. And if you've ever been to the park and you look towards where the hot springs are and the gondola is, um, and we have that administration building at the very back, it kind of looks like the castle. Well, up on the side is what is Sulphur Mountain. And on the west side of Sulphur Mountain, a lot of thick forest has built up over the years. 
Now this area has not seen fire for a very, very long time because people have been within the town of Banff for quite a while now. And uh, having a fire there would probably be too dangerous, too risky to the town site. However, if a fire were to start west of the town and move up the west side of Sulphur there, the fire could potentially reach our town site and threaten our community. So what we had to do was actually open that space up a bit and ensure that those closely growing trees were spread out more and that we had gaps in trees of open meadow. Because if a fire moves up, it won't be able to jump from tree to tree to tree as quickly if we have those gaps. So this is what it looks like now, kind of a more open space out there. There's still a bit more work to do in the coming years, um, but what you see is this more open meadow, and we were able to accomplish this simply by using machinery and cutting it down using people. Now it sounds very simple, but even something like this takes a lot of planning and research. For example, using mach machinery in the summertime, it could potentially damage all the sensitive plants underneath. So instead, we did a lot of this heavy work in the winter when the ground's protected by snow. And we were able to open the space up. And you can actually see this open space from the highway now. However, just removing trees with machinery well, it does not have the same impacts that fire does. Fire is really great because it recycles nutrients back into the ground. So all of those dead trees and logs and heavy branches, well, they're broken down and recycled back into the soil. And basically the ground is fertilized and it's ready for fresh new baby plants to pop up. So fire is actually a bit better for the environment in that sense. And it's better for animals like grizzly bears who remember rely on recently burned areas because of the increase in berries after a fire. So we do prefer to use fire, but it's not always possible. But now that we've opened that area on Sulphur Mountain and it's mostly meadow, we can probably do a smaller prescribed fire within the meadow itself and burn, and burn some of that material and recycle nutrients. And it won't be as risky to the people in the town of Banff. Of course, that would only be done after extensive planning. So we've reached the end of today's talk. Now, I just wanna ask you guys, when I showed you that video at the beginning of fire moving through the forest, do you still feel the same way that you did at the beginning? Or do you perhaps have new words to describe fire in our national parks? Because now we know that fire is actually important for the landscape. It creates new life, it creates new habitat, and it increases the health of our forest and ultimately its ecological integrity, so the park health. So if you guys have been drawing on that piece of paper, um, I encourage you to show me on screen or even email me the photo because I really love seeing those things. Because having everyone understand the important role that fire plays within our national parks is crucial in ensuring that we can continue our prescribed fire program. Having your support ensures that we're able to keep our communities safe and keep the park nice and healthy and increase habitat for critters like grizzly bears. Because fire is, after all, the prescription or a prescription for conservation. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Alex. That was awesome. So nice to have you back. And uh, what a, we covered so, so much in that. That was awesome. <laughs> All right, we're gonna dive in with questions. We probably have enough time for one question per group, but we'll see how fast we can get through them. And as I said, I'll put it up on the screen again in a second. Um, but Alex is really keen on you guys sending emails. So if we can't cover them all today and you wanna send emails, it was at the beginning of the talk. You can see it on the screen now if you're on YouTube as well. So check that out and you can find it even more. Let's start by going to Oshawa, to Genevieve and Juliet. I'm gonna add them to the screen. 
and uh, unmute their mic, and they should be good to go. Ladies, take okay. us away. Um, yeah, my question is, what's the difference between a grizzly bear and a black bear? Nice. Hi. Hi. <laughs> did you catch the question, Alex? I did not. Oh, okay. Sorry. What's the difference between a grizzly bear and a black bear? They want to know. That's a good question. Yeah. So there's a few differences between grizzlies and black bears, um, but probably the best way to tell them apart is grizzly bears have this really distinct hump at their shoulders that black bears don't have. And that hump is muscle that they use to turn over rocks and boulders and to dig. Grizzly bears also have these really long claws for digging, like shovels, whereas black bears have short, sharp claws for ripping into bark and climbing trees. But it's important to remember that both grizzly bears and black bears come in different colors. So color isn't the best way to tell them apart. Nice. Great question, ladies. Uh, thanks, Alex. So let's go to Dylan in North Carolina. I'm going to add you to the stream now. Unmute your mics. You should be good to go. There we go. And uh, go for it, man. My question was, how do you prevent animals to wandering into the fire area when you're burning? Good question. Sorry, and then that one either. Sorry. So how do you prevent animals from walking into the fire area when you're burning it? Like, how do you protect the wildlife that's actually there? Yeah, that's a very good question. So we're definitely concerned about wildlife when we use fire. So for that reason, we'll do fires outside of really critical periods, like when birds are nesting, for example. That being said, uh, wildlife has been adapted to fire for a very long time. So what we see is when animals start to sense fire, whether it's the smoke or the disturbance, we start to see them moving away from the area. So the larger animals will run away, we'll see birds flying away, and smaller critters like mice, well, they'll actually sometimes dig into the ground and burrow under and escape the heat that way. So they have adapted to fire because it's a natural process. That being said, when we get these really intense, large fires, um, sometimes wildlife cannot escape. So sometimes you do lose wildlife, but when we use more controlled fires, we're able to uh, control that a bit more. Um, so we do our best to help them out, but wildlife are very, very smart. And a lot of the time they escape on their own. Yeah. Oh, nice. All right, I'm going to bring in uh, Elizabeth and her family joining us in California. I'm going to bring them up to our question, guys. Let me just unmute your mic, which wants to work. There okay, we go. So my question was, um, why did the bear had like have? Why did the bear have the card stuck in his ear? Yeah. Why tag the bears, Alex? Yeah, that's a really good question. That looks funny, hey? Now, sometimes we have to track our bears, whether it's for research or management of bears. So we'll put a little ear tag in their ear to uh, figure out which bear it is. Now that ear tag is just a piece of plastic. So um, it's not heavy at all and it has a number on it and that helps us identify the bear. Now it's important to note that we're not tracking actually most of our bears. A lot of our park is remote backcountry. So a very small percentage of bears are tracked. That being said, fun fact, we can actually, if we see a bear with an ear tag, tell if it's a boy or a girl. Because if the ear tag is on the left hand side, it's a boy. And if it's on the right hand side, it's a girl. Cool. Neat thing. I love things like that for nature. That's awesome. Um, Alex, all right. So do you have time for another round of questions? Can I go to everyone one more time? Yeah, no, I have lots of time. We're good. Perfect. So I'll start with one on YouTube. Uh, actually, two on YouTube we just got. And thanks for everyone finally joining in on YouTube. That's awesome. Uh, what other animal species benefit from forest fires? Yeah, so a lot of wildlife do benefit from fires. It's not just grizzly bears, black bears, but also animals like elk. So elk really like to feed on the grass that pops up following a fire. It's very nutritious. It's like that spring grass that's full of like waters and um, really good minerals. So they'll feed on that new grass. Um, so it attracts elk. 
Other animals that benefit from fire are animals like bison. So you might have heard that we reintroduced bison to our park. And one of the ways that we prepared our landscape for the bison to arrive is by burning um, certain spots within the remote backcountry. And again, it increased the foods that they like to eat. So fire really benefits wildlife in terms of food, but it also opens really dense forests up and creates better living conditions for certain animals as well. Fantastic. All right, another YouTube comment before we go back to our live groups. Uh, Sunil wants to know, how did you find your passion in this field? What drove you to this? <laughs> That's a good question. So when I started as a wildlife guardian, I was going to school for environmental science. And so I actually started as a student and grew from there. And Bears have always been a passion of mine. I grew up in Calgary, so the Banff National Park was actually kind of like my backyard in a sense. Um, and so over time, I started seeing all the cool careers across Parks Canada. And what I really like about the fire communications role is I still get to talk to people about the park and share my passion of the park with them. But I also get to experience the fire world. So it's pretty cool understanding the way that we use fire in the landscape. I mean, getting to fly in helicopters is also pretty cool. I'm not going to lie. Um, so it's something I kind of stumbled upon in terms of fire, but I always knew that I wanted to work for Parks Canada. Nice. Great question. Great answer. All right, let's go back to Genevieve and Juliet. I'm going to bring you guys back into the stream. Uh, unmute your mic and you are good to go. Um. Do bears have predators? Ooh. <laughs> so in case you didn't get that, Alex, do bears have predators? Anything eating our bears? Is anything eating our bears? That's a good question. So pretty much the um, threats to bears are mostly people. So thankfully, we're not really out there eating our grizzly bears in the park. Um, that would be illegal. Don't do that. Um, but we do play a big role in terms of bear conservation. So what ends up happening is these bears come near the roadways like we talked about, and they're at risk of being hit by cars and trains. Um, so people are actually the biggest threat to bears. And you see that across um, natural bear habitats across Canada and in the United States, their biggest threat is people. That being said, other bears also fight for space and for food, so sometimes they're a threat to each other. Nice. All right, let's go back to Dylan in North Carolina. Come on in, man, and uh, go for it. Let's bring you up. So have bears ever attacked people because um, people get into their habitat? Yeah. Sorry, I didn't catch that one. Yeah, no worries. I know it seems to be a little delayed. So the question from Dylan is, have bears ever attacked people because people have gotten to their habitat? Do you have any bear attacks in Banff? Uh, thankfully, that doesn't really happen too often. What we see more of are encounters with bears. So something that we want to do is ensure that our park stays clean of human food and attractants. So when you're out in the park, it's so important that you don't leave your food unattended, you don't litter. All of this can attract bears because they're looking for really easy food sources. And when they get those easy food sources like human food, they can become conditioned. So they get really used to that food source and they keep returning. And if they return to a spot where they've been fed in the past, well, that next group of people, that bear is going to be expecting some food and you can have some negative encounters. So we definitely try and prevent that. And that's how the public helps us is by keeping our park clean from attractants. When you're camping, make sure that your tent is uh, free of any attractants. So things with smells. Bears have this really incredible sense of smell, so you don't want to leave even toothpaste in your tent. And when you're on the trails, you want to make lots of noise because bears a lot of the time have their nose in berry bushes and they're not paying a lot of attention to their surroundings. So you can surprise a bear and have an encounter that way. So it's important you make lots of noise on the trail, you travel in groups, and you carry your bear spray. And that's how we prevent these encounters. 
Fantastic. Thanks, Alex. All right, we're going to bring back in Elizabeth and Vincent one more time to wrap up with one final question. So we've got your mic unmuted, and you are good to go for a final Ooh. question. Go ahead, ask. <laughs> so, um, go ahead, ask. Yeah. So do, like, around how many bears would you say you have in Banff Park? Yeah, nice question. So how yeah, many one. Thank you. That's a very good question. So a lot of our park is actually quite alpine. There's uh, actually, if you think of our park, about 3% of it is really good habitat for bears. So those are the valley bottoms where we have rivers and lakes. We have a lot of bear foods, but we also have people. So like cars, um, highways, towns, etc. So there's a very little space that bears have in the park. That being said, we have about 50 to 60 grizzly bears and 50 to 60 black bears on average, but that's a really hard number to pinpoint because bears, well, they're not trapped inside our park. They move in and out constantly. And so that number is always changing. And remember, we only track a very small amount of our bears in the park. And so that is an estimation of our bears, um, not an exact number. It is a healthy population within the national park, however. Fantastic. Great questions, everyone. And again, I appreciate all the people who joined in on YouTube too. Uh, Alex, as we've said and, and highlighted a few times, passed along our email at the beginning of the presentation. So if you have more questions, do follow up directly. Check out our Parks Canada playlist on our YouTube channel as well for more from Alex and from the whole Parks Canada team. Some really great conservation stories coming out of Banff. And we're really excited for you guys to check those out. Before we wrap up too, something that we're launching in September, we'll be highlighting this all month long in our newsletters. So we are launching a backyard bio initiative all September long. So if you're a family at home, a classroom, and you want to get involved, share wildlife near you, uh, be as passionate about conservation as Alex is, we really encourage you to take part. So check those out and look for our newsletter for more. Um, Alex, thank you so, so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you being here. Of course, thank you for having me. And of course, I encourage everyone to send me more questions uh, through my email and check out our Parks Canada YouTube, YouTube channel and see more fire. Thank awesome. You I also pass along on the YouTube channel all the videos you sent me at the beginning. So Alex passed along a whole slew of really cool videos on fire. So check those out there. Lots of great stuff to keep the learning going.